with technology and rockets alone. It's built on the dreams, risk, and relentless spirit of those who dare look up and say, we belong there. For over 30 years, the Space Frontier Foundation has been a home for these visionary, radical, action-oriented individuals. Hear their stories, learn how space was shaped, and revel in the revolution of commercial space pioneers. Welcome again to Commercial Space Pioneers. Joined today by the man, the myth, the legend, Gary Hudson. Uh, and Gary, right off the bat, I got to tell you, um, I my first experience of learning about you as I kind of got into this industry was that centerpiece of Mojave Air and Spaceport that prominently sits there and welcomes everyone in. And I absolutely love it because it is the thing that welcomes people in, but it also is a thing that tells people that space is hard. Indeed. And I like to give credit where credit is due there because Rotown wouldn't have happened without my longtime business partner, Bev McKinney's uh, input was really his conception. I was simply the vessel that tried to make it happen. We'll we'll talk, you know, Mojave and all the cool stuff that's sure. happened there over the years. We'll get there. And I'm not going to ask for your like bona fides up front. Mm -hmm. If you're watching this, you already know that we're only talking to the people that have been the real people in it and doing it. My question is, I want to go back as you were growing up either, you know, adolescent or earlier, what, what was space when you were a kid that kind of laid your, the foundation of how you viewed this whole idea of people going into space? Sure. Well, my wife and I like to say it, it was all Walt's fault. When people say, <clears throat> Walt, and I said, yes, Walt Disney. Back in 19... I think it was 55 when I was five years old, there was a Disney television program in black and white because color had not yet been invented for TV as yet. Three part or three episode Sunday evening program called uh, Men Into Space. As an impressionable five-year-old, I bought the comic. I watched the program religiously. I never saw it again until I turned 50 in the year 2000 but I now have it on DVD and watched it with equal enjoyment uh, the second time around. Uh, and it showed uh, Von Braun and Stuhlinger and, and that crew talking about how you would do human space flight. And it left a very deep impression on me. It caused me to go to the local library and live among the stacks and, and read books by Billy Lay and and the Collier's series with uh, Bonnestell and Freeman's illustrations and so forth. And, and this just really implanted the vision of a space age in, in an impressionable young person's mind. Help us understand a little bit, because there's a few of us that have not accumulated as much experience as you have. Mm -hmm. If this was, you said 19, 1955? 55, right. Okay. Five Please years start. old, 1955. Good. I can follow that one. This is not the right stuff. This is not big videos of, of rockets launching. This is before any of that. Yes, I mean, this is in the V2 to Viking to uh, the original Viking, not the Mars lander, to not yet Vanguard, not yet Sputnik, not yet uh, Jupiter C Explorer. Okay. So you, you're hooked even Pre Sputnik, there you go. All right, so did this become a like on your list of things as a kid? If you're starting out as a five year old, and five year olds are notorious for getting deep into a thing, and then the next week it's something else. Right. So you went literally deep into the stacks. Did and it and never came out? Never came out. Right. So what was did you well i guess asking what your passion was before you found that episode is going to be tough but like so you've really been all in on space since you were five yes yeah and i don't recall any passion prior to that time but that the passions never left i mean this is what i do it, it's yeah you know the the external locus of my existence is is uh, moving 
humankind into space. Well, there's not a better place to talk about it than right here. So, all right. So what, as you're watching, you're growing up and forming, you know, mental capacities as the early American space program, as you're seeing the the competition with Russia and the U.S., do you have any recollection of how, you know, pre-Apollo, as you're following it, what was your sense of that? Was it a conflict? Was it a competition? Yeah, good question. I, well, I mean, it was clearly a little bit of both. The Cold War was in, in full swing. When I went to school, we did duck and cover because of the, the threat of nuclear war. We, I mean, only a few years later, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. That was, I guess, 62 when I was 12. We used to watch, I mean, we we all clustered around a, a black and white television at my grade school when John Glenn was launched and, and when Alan Shepard was launched and Gus Grissom was launched and so forth. It was very much part of the American culture at the time. I wrote my first book report on Billy Lay's illustrated books about space when I think it was seven. I read Arthur Clarke's Profiles of the Future. It made a deep impression on me. I got to meet Arthur 10 years later and, and we became friends. You know, it just, it set me on this particular path and I pretty much never wavered from that path. Though I, there is a slight detour I took in, in my late, late teens. As you are a teenager, space is going from science fiction and prognostication mm-hmm. to real. Right. To me, that sounds like that's a huge step. Did it feel like that was a huge, or did that just seem like it was the natural evolution and that's what should happen? It was totally natural. Uh, (laughs) It it was like, there was never a question whether it was faith or intellect or whatever that put me on this path. You know, as I say, I've never wavered and, and I always expected things to happen much, 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 much faster than than they in fact happened. The the moon race is on as you are trying to figure out what to study. Did you go high school to college or what was like what was your as you're trying to figure out how to turn this into something, was there a training for space or was it something else? So I I was a a ridiculously accomplished student at from kindergarten through end of high school in 68 which i did all at the same school okay. st bernard's a parochial school a catholic parochial school in in uh, st paul minnesota so i was a, a very good student i recall the only problem i ever had in school i mean i i was probably the archetypical nerd but uh, the only problem i ever had was my chemistry teacher gave me a chemistry set to take home and, and I flunked a, a test in spelling, and she threatened to take away my chemistry set if I, if I didn't um, improve uh, on spelling. <laughs> so I did get much, very much better than that, but, but was close to a 4.0 student, uh, won the leadership award for the school, you know, um, acted in plays, and, and had a, a reasonably calm childhood and, uh, and growing up. But I never thought that education was the key mm. to my ambition. Okay. Like, I already know what I'm going to do. Yeah, I have to learn a few things along the way, but it wasn't to get credentials. Okay. So Ooh, to go to an... work for Boeing or Douglas or or something like that. That's an important distinction right there. That because yeah. there is credentialism, which is like, oh, I need to I need these things as badges to get me in. And you were seeing education as things like elements you had to get, but it wasn't really relevant to the direct thing. And do you have any idea of what the concept was? Okay, so you're, okay, space is a big thing. As Mm -hmm. you were in your high school years, like what was it that you knew you were going to be doing something in space, but did it have any more flavor or color than that? It formed 
sometime in the 60s, I couldn't tell you exactly when, but I, I think there were two components to it. One is I wanted to see a true science fiction um, like future emerge, you know, where you you lived in space, lived and worked in space permanently. Yeah, I saw it as a high frontier, uh, an endless frontier that, you know, sort of manifest destiny, human kind okay. going to the stars type of thing. So I was, that was the goal. The role that I wanted to play, I think solidified probably around 1968 or so, 69. When I read Frontiers uh, in Space by Bono and Gatland, they talked about the problem of space transportation. So that's when I began to focus on the, the real question of space transportation. And I actually communicated with and visited both of the authors, Phil Bono at uh, Douglas, or at that time McDonald Douglas Corporation in Huntington Beach, um, who was notable for his concepts of single stage to orbit and fully reusable launch vehicles. And Ken Gatlin, who was the, he headed the British Interplanetary Society. In 1964, I was um, a volunteer at the Science Museum of Minnesota and a speaker from the BIS came by and, and gave a Saturday afternoon lecture and talked me into joining. And so I've actually been a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society since the mm -hmm. late 60s. Um, as I said, I visited with Gatland, and that is what actually led me to Arthur Clarke, because on that, it was, I think I was 20 or 21, perhaps 22. I was in London uh, talking to Gatland, and he said, well, you should talk to Val Cleaver, who had an engine development at Rolls-Royce. And I told Val Cleaver what I wanted to do, which was build the Phoenix single stage door, but fully reusable launch vehicle. And Cleaver, we were having lunch at, at near Piccadilly Circus. And he said to me, uh, you can no more do that than levitate yourself over Piccadilly Circus in this instant. He said, and I have, have a friend who will explain that to you. Do you know who Arthur Clark is? Uh, and I said, yes. And he said, well, I'll set up a meeting. And so the next day I had a meeting with Clark who was in visiting from Ceylon, Sri Lanka, uh, now at his club at Arts Theatre Club in London. And, and we talked for hours about my ambitions. But um, but it, it illustrates one thing. I was never afraid mm -hmm. to knock on the door of great people. You know, when I was 18, Jim Webb, then retired head of NASA, came to town. And I went up, knocked on his hotel room door. <laughs> <laughs> and he spent an afternoon talking to me about space systems management. I'm 18 years old, and he yeah, I... spent that time. Managed to spend a little bit of time with Ed White, the astronaut who did the first U.S. spacewalk. I think that would have been in 65 or so. And, he, of course, he died a couple of years later in the Apollo 204 fire. So I, you know, I, I figured I would learn by osmosis, by talking to, to great men who had accomplished great things. And a little bit of that would rub off on me along the way. And I was an arrogant, you know, young pup to, to think that I could do that. But these guys were um, kind enough to, you know, not kick me to the curb and actually have a decent conversation with me and teach me things. And how did you manage, like you're in Minnesota, Yes. How are you showing up in London and California and like, yeah. are you, yeah, are, that's are a, you just that's hopping a on a Greyhound or like what, no, how no, did that happen? It's a two part story. Well, I, I grew up not poor and not rich. My father was a sort of self-made man. He, he had a small business. It was himself, his mother and me on, on, um, in, during summers. Uh, he was basically a wholesaler of, of grocery products and such, sufficient that we had a comfortable middle-class existence. Also, uh, through high school, I participated in science fair projects, and I, I won things like trips to Washington, D.C., you know, trips to San Diego, representing the state of Minnesota as a you know some sort of exceptional student. I got 
to do a little bit of travel that way. Uh, and then in the 70s, uh, I actually made my living as a public speaker. For the entire period of the 70s, I made my living as a public speaker on the subject of space, uh, and specifically commercial space things. IBM was one of my largest customers, and they would pay me ridiculous amounts of money to go on the lecture circuit for them to talk to their management classes. So I'd get like $2,000 to plus travel expenses to go places. It means I didn't have a job. I mean, I, I, I mean that was my job and yeah. it was like three days a month. So uh, I had, the, I mean, it was just this miraculous opportunity to spend time and learn you know, rather than sort of waste time in college. I did attend college, but in, in a couple of graduate programs at the University of Minnesota in physics and medicine, but uh, dropped out because I, I simply couldn't pursue the agenda that I wanted to pursue. Again, it's mm -hmm. that, you know, arrogance of youth that it's like, uh, did I really do those things? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that has come full circle you have uh, peter thiel like trying to encourage people to not like to drop out of school to do his uh, experimental thing so you were the you were doing that before it was cool I, I was the ar archetype before it was an archetype <laughs> yeah all right so all right wow so you're really you're not kidding you're really caring and and deep into this mm -hmm. um space world you're talking to a lot of people that are both on like engineering solution side, but also um, communication, right. uh, you know, the sci-fi sort of thing. So yeah. you're, you've stitched a bunch of these different things together. You know, was there, was there a particular point here where you had a, a change of a vision about what this was going to be. And the, the reason I'm asking that is uh, at what point did you come across uh, Gerard K. O'Neill, like in terms of his ideas? Yeah. So, well, let, let me actually go back 10 years Please. before I met Jerry. I think it was probably 1970. First time I had been to the UK, I got together with a science fiction writer, uh, I've been fortunate to to number a number uh, a lot of science fiction writers of so-called hard science fiction, the golden age, uh, as friends and acquaintances. But th this fellow James Blish wrote a series of books called the Cities in Flight uh, series, uh, which was basically taking it from kind of present day late sixties, early seventies uh, type environment to to the far future one of the visions of one of the early characters in that book began to encapsulate my vision of the future, which was he, he was dreaming of an immortal man who flew to the stars faster than light. You, when people would say to me, what is your ambition? It's, you know, um, to fly the stars and live forever is, is the, the elevator, you know. <laughs> I'll slip to another anecdote. This is what old men do is we we tell anecdotes now. Right? So the, the next <laughs> anecdote was when I, I met with Arthur um, Clark the first time in London. We, one point in the conversation, he asked me something like, you know, well, what's your uh, long-term ambition? And I said, there's a, a phrase in a chapter of your book, Profiles of the Future, called Space the Unconquerable, where he talks about the limitation of the speed of light. And uh, the last sentence of that chapter, no man will ever turn homeward at, at 26 light years distance. No man will ever turn homeward from beyond Vega to greet those he knew and loved on earth. Mm -hmm. Because that's about the limitation of a human yeah. life now. And I said, my ambition was to prove him wrong. <laughs> and, 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 and Arthur, he looked at me for, a, you know, I, I'm 22, right? And he looked at me and he said, uh, perhaps you shall. So instead of saying, you know, you stupid get, <laughs> you know, I was just making money writing a book. You know, he he actually was encouraging, and and that was um, profound for me. 
anyway, so I, I spent this, the rest of the 70s thinking about the problem of space transportation, designing what were admittedly naive solutions to that, uh, that problem, looked at nuclear propulsion, all this sort of thing. You're saying naive. When did you realize that what you were doing then was considered naive? Is that is that you today calling yeah. them naive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the, there were elements of of the designs that will, would have worked, but it, every time, I mean, there, there's a reason why an aircraft designer, you know, who maintains a, a, a library of their designs and notebooks or whatever, goes through in their lifetime three or 400 designs. You know, I, Bert Rutan, I, you know, was at model 350 or something when um, I think he retired. So it's because we sketch things out, right? Yeah. Um, there's this, this uh, there's a book called The Engineering Through the Mind's Eye that talks about the, the eye-hand connection that kind of mm -hmm. bypasses the brain. It's it's an intuitive design process of, you know, you doodle and sketch, and that's how you come up with in innovation. But these things are fairly complicated. You know, a launch vehicle, a reusable launch vehicle is pretty darn complicated, as you know. You're going to make mistakes along the way, and you're not going to recognize that they're mistakes until you actually, this is why rapid pro prototyping is important. You can build it, you break it, you know, the, this is... Yeah principal contribution in my mind of SpaceX to the world is that um, Elon had enough of his own money as versus the rest of us who had to go out and try and raise money to do many iterations of app, rapid prototype and not care when he crashed, you know, 10, you know, first stages or something. Anyway, going to the, to when I met uh, Jerry, I had gotten to the point of saying, well, reusables are going to be too hard. You're not going to be able to find the money to do it there was you know the shuttle program was in full bloom at that time and in fact i had gotten together with von braun to talk about reusable launch vehicles this was i think 72 or and i even asked him you know to to join the board of directors of a company that i wanted to start and he said if you build payloads for the shuttle i will do it but if you try and compete with the shuttle yeah, I can't do it because, you know, Senator Mondale will use it to kill the shuttle program, say, well, there's a commercial path to to doing this and we can't afford the shuttle program to be killed. And later, my mentor, Max Hunter, said to me the story about, it, which I think Von Braun told to him at one point, was when you are in a rowboat with an elephant crossing a, a swiftly moving stream, you rock when he rocks and you think about changing the arrangement when you get to the other side <laughs> and, and the shuttle was the elephant in the boat at that time not the elephant in the room so much so uh, but, but hold on. I, I know we're getting you're heading to the thing that i asked you about yeah I gotta, so, no, I, got, I gotta ask when when he tells you this and he he states it flatly that like okay great i'll mm -hmm. i'm on board love to help you if it complements the program of record right what did you think like do you have do you recall he turned it down <laughs> okay i mean i was an arrogant bastard i turned von braun down i mean he was a gracious you know gentleman who was offering to do me a favor and because i was a, a stupid young punk i turned him down um, did you did you believe like was that concept of needing to be part of this larger machine that like did you just dismiss that or were you like yeah it, it was anathema to me it was like okay you know, i i know better i mean all young people think they know better than their elders right it's you know it, that's been the case since you know samaria <laughs> and ur um so yeah i was i was just a punk kid yeah, but you did it. I don't, punk or not, <laughs> you blew off Warner Von Braun. It seems like now you really appreciate that wisdom that he imparted to you. Mm -hmm. Any idea when, between when he said it and now, when did you go, oh, all right, that actually might be important or in, right? or In the 80s, uh, but I, I actually designed what I believe to be the first phased array geostationary small sat 
kind of like what Astronus is doing now, mm -hmm. specifically for the shuttle bay. Because at the time, the pricing on the shuttle bay was not weight lifted to orbit, it was length. Okay. You know, so NASA had this, I don't know if it was an arbitrary criteria or what that allowed them to settle on it. But if you could make very thin spacecraft that slotted into the, the keel and uh, trunnion fittings of the shuttle, you could fly for some ridiculous low amount of money, like $8 million a flight or something like that. So I designed this 15 foot diameter, two foot thick spacecraft. The, the solar wings folded up on it. It had a phased array instead of a shaped antenna and all the propellant was uh, in the body and it could raise itself to geostationary orbit from, um, from the shuttle bay, offer you know a couple of transponders worth at a time. So. Uh, I realize that when you look from the ground to geostationary orbit, a slot looks only like two degrees wide. So you could co-locate, you know, a dozen spacecraft in that slot because that's uh, like 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers worth okay. of arc length, right? So you just maneuver the spacecraft around a central point and from the ground, an antenna thinks it's one spacecraft. So you didn't have to, you know, put up 24 transponders at a time or 50 transponders at a time to make money. Anyway, that Okay, so you all right, so you eventually did come to appreciate that, but mm -hmm. that is important because that real like that is a a truth of the space world. Whether right. it's a good thing or a bad thing and when does it blah, blah like but it's important to understand that Space doesn't happen in a vacuum. Terrible, <laughs> but like, like th Perfect. that political reality, and that's that was you said in the early seventies. Yeah, that was I think seventy two. Yeah. Uh, so this is not like the shuttle's been flying and oh, no, impacts no. on the market. Then this is still like, at the beginning of the shuttle program. Yeah, like literally. we have just about our last Apollo mission, right? Anyway, okay. Well, actually, the last Apollo mission was flown that that month, and it was the only one I actually managed to attend. I got a VIP invitation to Apollo 17. But anyway, to, to, to go back to your um, yeah. uh, O'Neill. <laughs> yeah, it, and the O'Neill the the concept as much as the person, right? Because... Yeah, yeah. So the, the concept, you know, he was doing this with his students at Princeton in the very early 70s. And so I followed it with a great deal of interest. My concern was getting stuff into orbit. And he was basing it on the shuttle. And I knew that the shuttle was never going to be $10 million a flight for 65,000 pounds. Did it, you it, throw something at him? Did you like, now, I, I feel like we're gearing up for like you kicked him in the shins but all right please yeah, go sort of, sort of it was a friendly <laughs> kick uh, okay <laughs> so I, what i did is i i was also transitioning away from full reusability at the time to uh, expendable commercial launch vehicles as sort of a initial step to okay. generate enough revenue to get to full reusability so i uh, came up with a concept that used f1 engines in recovery capsules that was modular so it was basically like at that time companies like otrag were looking at you know sort of an asparagus stock type vehicle with lots of you know super dumb pressure fed engines and so on um i said well you know i'd, I'd like to do this with an engine that was no longer in production but was on the cusp of just having gone out of production so you could okay. potentially get them um i designed this thing up i've I don't know that I even gave it a name, but it was a bunch of, I think they were like 12 or 15 foot diameter, sort of Falcon size. If you imagine a bunch of Falcon first stages okay. them wrapped around a core or three in a line. Uh, and it would put fairly significant payloads, you know, sort of Falcon heavy class payloads into orbit. And I thought it could do it quite cheaply. So I sent that to O'Neill and and his interest was basically, you know, it costs way too much money to develop a new launch vehicle. So we have to stick with shuttles. So I didn't have a lot of content. This was like very late seventies, like 78 or more. So um, Space Studies Institute had just 
uh, stood up by him at that time. Uh, and he was mainly pushing satellite solar power as the economic incentive to drive uh, space, what he called colonization, what I like to call settlement at the time. So I pivoted even further to a, a purely expendable vehicle um, called Percheron that became the U.S.'s first private commercial launch vehicle attempt, which I crashed and burned in Texas in 1981, but did manage to seek and find uh, um, a modicum of, of private funding to get developed. And it put me in very much direct engagement with NASA. The, you know, it, uh, the NASA general counsel at the time said, well, we have regulatory authority over all spaceflight, you know, which there's nothing in the Space Act of 1958 as amended that gave them that permission. But the, this is where the whole FAAST, what was originally the Office of Commercial Space Transportation established by an act of Congress in 84, flowed out of. So I was directly responsible for creating that act, not in a good way, but in, <laughs> it, it was in response to the fact that I used a loophole in the FAA code, which said that unmanned rockets, you know, you, you had to file one piece of paper to launch an unmanned rocket. One okay. piece of paper. And it cost, you know, like $1,000 in attorney's fees to, to file that. And we got our permission to to fly that vehicle. Of course, we blew it up on in an engine test. But, you know, setting that aside, the, uh, you know, I, what happened was my uh, partners, uh, my investor partners became Space Services, Inc. You know, um, that that ultimately became the Conestoga one and, and Conestoga two and, and so forth. And, but, you know, circling back to, to O'Neill, it was only about 10 years later that Jerry and I and Tanya and my wife Anne found ourselves at a governor's conference in Hawaii on commercial space activities at the time. Hawaii was talking about a commercial space launch site on the Big Island, which never, of course, went anywhere. But we we spent a week together on the the Big Island and and talked through his ideas for a G, uh, a commercial GPS mm -hmm. triad uh, would have replaced. Um, the current GPS because GPS was not available to the to the public during the 80s. And so we got to be pretty friendly at that time. And previously, I'd also been quite friendly with Ted Taylor and Freeman Dyson from Orion days. I knew them during the 70s during my short excursion into looking at nuclear pulse propulsion as a way to build um, planetary spaceships. Uh, solar system spaceships, as Max Hunter used to call them. So when Jerry regrettably passed away from uh, cancer in the early 70s and Freeman took over, you know, we had some chats about Space Studies Institute, but it kind of became moribund for a long time until Freeman asked me in the, I think it was like 2010, to, to take over from him because he was trying to, to divest himself from assignments that he, he couldn't adequately follow. So folks are not familiar right off space studies institute was yep. founded by gerard o'neill similar uh focus and there are there are so many space organizations uh that a lot of them share an awful lot of similar roots and similar connections and sometimes it's the exact same people that you will see where you know in this group and in that group um and so the space frontier foundation also very uh, connected to the O'Neillian future vision. Um, yes. But it, it, as, yeah, as you're talking about your solution set, right, you're, you're going through, you're iterating, you're saying, okay, single stage, okay, maybe partially reusable, okay, expendable. Mm -hmm. What is your expectation of space? How is that evolving? What are the inflection points that drove your iteration? Was there some revelation of, oh crap, I've been going down the wrong path or like? Yeah, so the, I think the revelation was and continues to be money. Uh, I mean, how much money can you raise? And I, I think you can do an expendable for 
you know, considerably less than a reusable, depending on the technologies that are available. And, you know, data comes you know, not, you know, well, it comes at a continuous stream to you if, if you were doing what I was doing during the 70s, which is, you know, going to conferences, talking to people, going, it, it was a time ITAR didn't exist, right? The, you know, international traffic and arms regulations and limitations on, uh, you know, uh, publishing papers and so on. I mean, we, we talked about everything. I mean, yeah. uh, I talked critical nuclear weapons design information with people. You know, I mean, it, there, there was literally no, uh, it, it may have been nominally verboten to, to do, but nobody paid any attention to it. So I, I, yeah, I remember once uh, talking to some senior friends, I mean, we're talking vice presidential level type people at, at uh, McDonnell Douglas saying to me, you know, I, I really need to understand how the, the, um, the Delta II first stage is put together, and they sent me the blueprints. Okay, I mean, I had I had the entire suite of blueprints for Delta II, you know, including all the manufacturing information. I, and, I could and, have one. And out of curiosity, yeah. why would they just like? Isn't that proprietary information, or like, it, do they were they worried about you? No. No, I mean, and, and they knew what I was interested in. Yeah. You know, bu building alternative. It was a completely different time. Why do you, uh, why do you think that is? Like, Well, the, because there was no commercial IP, you know, intellectual property consideration really being applied. You know, government contracts get kind of handed out, you know, well, Convair got, one last year, so this year it's going yeah. to go to Douglas, right? To to uh, level set the the industry mm -hmm. so that one company never had a leg up on a, another company. Uh, and it's only when that system kind of got out of control and companies like Rocketdyne and and Rockwell got thrown really massive contracts that uh, you started to see this forced consolidation of the industry and. And mm. now things got tighter and tighter. And then, of course, with the Clinton China stuff in the late 90s, you know, ITAR got clamped down on all of us. And we've all got our ITAR stories. But it was a completely open environment. I mean, go out to an AIAA conference. How many papers are submitted by SpaceX? I don't. None. Really? I mean, there are. I think I've found three or four SpaceX papers. Okay. In the last 15 years. Hmm. Okay. All right. and, they don't share. Okay. And they use the excuse of ITAR, but there it's clearly a, a proprietary trade secret type thing. So so the industry in many respects stagnates because of that. This lack yeah. of the, it was a very freewheeling conversation. You know, I, I could walk into NASA headquarters in the early 80s, no security, no nothing, you know, go down yeah. into the library, spend my back to the stacks you know, hours back in the stacks, you know, between <laughs> meetings, like I'd have, you yeah. know, these, I, I remember that I mentioned that uh, attending the Apollo 17 launch, I was standing next to a vice president of Chrysler Corporation with my camera. Yeah. Uh, right next to the VAB um, because there was a, about a three hour delay because of a vent problem on a Saturn third stage. And we got to talking and he asked me what I did and I explained I, I was a designer of single stage door but reusable launch vehicles. He said, oh, you know, we got a big contract for the shuttle phase B activity for Chrysler Serve, which was a single stage ex uh, exp uh, non-expendable um, reusable launch vehicle that Charles Therrett and his team put together. It, and I said, oh, I've never seen that report. He said, I'll send it to you. So I fly back home to Minnesota. And a couple of days later, UPS delivers a crate, right? And it's the entire serve report, you know, multi-million dollar report, microfiche as well as hard copy, <laughs> which I still have, you know, just no questions asked. I mean, yeah, yeah, I still refer to that report and things. And I, I, I it's staggering. <laughs> yeah, and and especially my my lived experience is tremendous amount of competition within companies. 
Yes. And there still is a lot of, there's a lot of cop. Maybe people are all following a similar trend, but there's, there is, you know, benchmarking against your competition and things like that. And it's, it's a zero sum, you know, Very much there's so. only so much work to go around. Um, right. But that's, that's really phenomenal. So it, as you're getting huge volumes of, of this stuff and you're start, by the way, when you did your launch and NASA got upset about it, did they like call you up on the phone and say, Hey, this is NASA. And you like, yeah, funny. Like, did yeah. they show up at your door with a padlock or what? How did NASA show up to say, Hey, space is our domain. Get out of here. Well, we are my attorney at the time um, who also facilitated the investment, which came from David Hanna and his friends in, in Houston in the oil and gas business. Um, Ardula, who was Houston based, mm -hmm. he, um, he actually sent a, um, I, I'm pretty sure he sent a letter to Neil Hosenball, the NASA general counsel at the time, who made this claim to us in a letter and basically said, you know, bugger off this, you know, it's, you know, you have no authority here. And they, they shut up on that. But of course, what's going to happen is the Houston community is very close knit with NASA. And at the time, NASA was very hostile to commercial space. Very, very hostile. I mean, it's a complete 180 flip these days, of course, but but it took four decades for that to happen, or at least three right. decades for that to happen. And um, so the the space services guys asked for NASA JSC to not investigate, but to um, to do an assessment of you know what about our design and all this. And my design, frankly, was crappy. It was what I could afford to do on one point four million dollars. I mean, it was a, it it. it is was depressingly poor engineering at the time but it's all i could do and yeah. they sent um, a fellow henry pole who to his credit wrote a report back saying well you know yeah they made a few mistakes here and there but if they fix those things they you know they would have had a chance to make it work and he actually said that to the press and it was published in in, okay. in the, the local papers so but deke slayton got involved in this and he was one of the astronauts i never knew i knew probably 30 or 40 of them so he managed to convince david hannah and crew that they wanted to transition to solid fuel because it was simpler and more reliable <clears throat> well i knew one thing for certain in my life which is solid fuel rockets were never going to be cheaper than a liquid um, system and they of course had no role to play in reusability as we've evidenced from the shuttle activity right that's that's when S uh, space uh, services pivoted to solids and they even offered me a job at a ridiculous i, I think they offered me seventy five thousand dollars to be like head of research or something like that and you know I, at that time, I was 30 and not a 20 year old punk, but I still turned him down uh, because I didn't see a future for that. And that's when I sort of pivoted back to various Phoenix designs, which ultimately led to the DCX program and the, the flights of DCX. So uh, we had uh, there's another conversation with Jess Sponable uh, and several other people that were around mm -hmm. DCX. Uh, What's your path to this this first like DCX still I think counts as the first yes rocket that landed right? yes correct it, uh, powered landing yeah powered landing um, going up so, is easy coming down is even easier it's yeah. the landing part that, the soft landing yeah. that's really hard yeah. <laughs> yeah so so what happened there was in the mid seventies I got a fairly close working relationship with Max Hunter, who was at Lockheed and had worked on Hubble Space Telescope, but before that was principally a launch vehicle guy. He was third, you know, chief engineer on third stage of Saturn V, um, some the Lockheed Space Shuttle plants and so forth. And so Max essentially became my mentor unofficially. We just worked together for years. And, and then when he retired from Lockheed, or as he was retiring, 
he spent a lot of time with me. He, his version of my Phoenix was called SSX or Spaceship Experimental. And so he was a big fan of bringing back X planes to uh, which NASA had abandoned, you know, sort of after the 60s because of budget limitations. Uh, so he and I together kind of did a, he, he from the Lockheed point of view, me from the, you know, just me going out being a rabble rouser, did this, this multi-core press to get the government interested in reusable launch vehicles. I mean, this basically now post-Challenger. Uh, and a, a big role was also played by Danny Graham's High Frontier Organization and by um, Jerry Pornell's uh, Citizens Council for National Space Policy, Citizens Advisory Council for National Space Policy, which the Reagan administration asked him to form as an ad hoc group. We had like eight meetings between 1980 and 1988, the last of which, you know, I, I was always presenting Phoenix and I was always being shot down by most of the conventional aerospace guys at, at the time until the last meeting when it was adopted as the output of the, the council to advise them to, to move ahead. And we had Aerospace Corporation actually write a report. It was, it was kind of an interesting report um, that J. Penn and um, uh, Charles, they wrote a report aerospace management forced them to to water it down but even watered down it basically it was called the phoenix uh, colon ssx report and they essentially said it was worth doing now the bush white house with dan quayle as head of the national space council to approve the the program and and it went forward because of that. so that is the genesis of of dcx and it's, uh, I have two professional honors in my, my misfit career. One is, of course, the Space Frontier Foundation's kind Founders Award to me in 2007. But the the other is, um, along with Jeff Spottable, Jerry Purnell, Max Hunter, Pete Warden, uh, I, I was on the Aviation Week and Space Technology Laurel Award for 1994 for DCX. Mm, all right. I'm going to ask a somewhat crass question. How yes. are you paying your bills while you're doing all these great things for the betterment of society? Like as you are, you know, you, you seem to be constantly right there pushing the, the boundary, sometimes, you know, kicking important people down the stairs or whatever. But, but so as you're doing that, um, like, were you still speaking and like, yeah, you, you can thank uh, IBM. Um, okay. th throughout the eighties, they, they kept me going in very hard times by paying me for public lecturing. I stopped doing that about the time of DCX it, where, where I was on two of the teams. Um, Max was on the Doug uh, McDonald Douglas team. I was on the Boeing team under Dana Andrews and also on the general dynamics team. Okay. And out of curiosity, when you're out there. So you're talking to people that are at an IBM, like these are not rocket people at IBM, no, right? Software managers typically. Okay. So the, what are you telling them about? Or is this like, hey, here's someone who's going to give you an inspirational, were you the? Yeah, I, I was the after dinner speaker. Uh, okay. You know, they, they would have these week long management classes and on Thursday night they would hold, you know, a banquet type thing. And, and I was the after dinner speaker talking about technology in general, but with a focus on space. And, and it turns out, surprisingly, I was a pretty popular speaker and it got space. me, I mean, it, it brought me, for example, to Unispace in 1982, which was a UN conference in Vienna. So I, I gave a lecture in Brussels and then for IBM and then flew to Vienna on a cheap flight. I have a very brief anecdote of meeting Arthur Clark again at that time. We've only been corresponding by by letter, of course. Uh, there was no such thing as email. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm standing, you know, I have no credentials to attend this United Nations conference. The doors are guarded by guys and some machine guns and so forth. And I'm standing there and Jerry Gray of the AIAA, who didn't much care for me because I was a rabble rouser walks by with his credentials and looks at me and says, what are you doing here? You have no business being here. And, and I said, I'm just hanging out. And at that instant in time, like 
you know, the Almighty has, you know, just, oh. you know decided to, yeah, the clouds parted and the light ray came down and touched me. Arthur walks up and says, Gary, and comes up and embraces me and, and says, come on in. You know, I'm Ambassador Extraordinary and Plino Potentiary from <laughs> Sri Lanka. <laughs> He takes me by the hand and drags me into this conference where I spent the rest of the day. And Jerry's, Jerry's face was priceless at, at that moment in time. Anyway, uh, so yeah, that's how I got around and, and did things. Um, I certainly didn't make any money from the rocket business until Boeing and GDE started you know, hiring me to do stuff. And then in the very, well, after DCX, Bob Citrin uh, of Space Hab and Walt Kistler, who was one of the funders of Space Hab originally, uh, decided Walt wanted to do a reusable. He called the K0 and then the K1. And he engaged, um, at that time, Amrock, my competition in the expendable launch business that Bevan McKinney was one of the founders of, had gone out of business after the death of George Koopman uh, and the loss of their set one vehicle at, at Vandenberg, which I think was 89 or thereabouts. So uh, we had never met. We had just been competitors. Um, we got together one one day at a restaurant and dis we were born within 10 days of each other uh, in the same year. We had exactly the same trajectory, the same college dropout, you know, the, the whole story of our life. I mean, it was like we were mirror images. So we decided to go into business. We created a company called HMX for Hudson McKinney Experimental to be kind of the scaled composites of, of the rocket business. Okay. And went up to um, Seattle to talk to Kistler when they started Kistler Aerospace and ended up with the contract to do the propulsion systems for uh, for um, the K0 one afternoon. It was like a $1.4 million contract. And it, it you know just fell into our laps. That's what put us on the trajectory that ultimately ended it with uh, Bev and I and Rotary Rocket. And then subsequently, you know, the Rascal program with DARPA, the air launch program, T-Space and all that of the 2000s. There is, in case anyone who is watching this isn't aware, there is so much to unpack just in the section of things that you've already talked about, much less all of the things you have done since, uh, but we're out we of <laughs> We're going to save that. We'll have to have like another, um, another, we should have our, our own series just talking to you. Uh, tell common. me if, if, if you can, um, like as you think about that, that period, uh, you know, up until the two thousands, um, there's a lot, of activity and a lot of grinding and shifting of what the perception of space is going to be as it goes i mean literally from science fiction to reality and then some of that stuff that von braun was talking about like the political realities of it how how do you recall your trajectory across that in terms of where was your where was your thinking changing and when were you um, inspired and when were you depressed and like, what were the things, you know, are there any D marks where you can think of, yeah, I, I knew what I was going to do, but I hit a wall and I wasn't sure. Yeah. So, well, the wall has always been financing. I mean, I, at one point, Jerry Pornell introduced me to a friend of his, Tom Clancy, the, the author, yep. uh, and Tom and I, this was in the very early nineties, Tom and I, um, spent a, a fair amount of time trying to raise money privately for uh, a reusable launch vehicle. We failed. He was very apologetic uh, about that. He tried very hard. I spent a lot of time with him at his house in, uh, on Chesapeake Bay, which is, for those of you who are Clancy fans, an exact copy of uh, Jack Ryan's house in Patriot Games. Tom later became an investor in Rotary. I think I saw a beginning of, of the shift of the political sands. I mean, even during the 90s, NASA was largely hostile to uh, any sort of commercial space. They were starting to, to accept reusable launch uh, alternatives 
because they took over DCX and then, you know, the abortive and badly managed X33 program happened. At the time of Rotary, of course, there was Kelly Space and Technology, there was uh, Kistler, there was Pioneer Rocket Plane, and Lori Garver and her crew actually, at that point, became much more involved in, in getting NASA to in, try and engage with these commercial firms. So they they offered us money. Our lead investor at Rotary did not want to take any government financing at all. And okay. so we we ended up turning it down, but they, they were offering us like $7 million or something. And then there was sort of this post-internet stock bubble collapse that happened in the early 2000s. <laughs> and at that time, I went to my whiteboard and I drew a Venn diagram, you know, two, two Venn diagram circles, which are the intersection of the sets of the interests of investors and the interests of customers. And the intersection is like this. There's practically none. Yeah. Because well, investors are interested in, you know, a quick exit strategy, you know, at 10 times multiple of their money. And so sure. customers just want problems solved and they're willing to, to pay for that. So that was when I decided to be like Willie Horton of the bank robber, you know, why do you rob banks? It's because where the money is. Yeah. Uh, I, I pivoted to government financing and we did programs, the old access program for, for NASA, which was sort of the first idea of, of, you know, like the COTS program of carrying commercial cargo to, to a space, to the space station, working with DARPA and, you know, that's where I learned how to do other transaction authority activity, which is basically like space act agreements that NASA wasn't using and help teach NASA how to do space act agreements, which led to the COTS program and it led to T-Space winning the C and our concept exploration and refinement uh, program that uh, the White House put into place after Columbia in 73, all of which sort of paved the road for, cleared the minefield, as it were, for uh, SpaceX. Yeah, there's a certain degree of, I'm bitter. <laughs> you loose, yeah. you helped loosen the lid, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Right, like, yeah. And, and, and you're not alone. Yes. Not and, not. But but you're right. Yeah. It, there's a tremendous amount of work mm -hmm. in pushing the whole industry forward to get to the point where such a thing could exist. All of us who have worked in the industry have a, an eternal debt of gratitude to you for that constant shoulder to the wheel over decades and decades to help make today's space world exist um because okay. you, you can't just sit around and be like okay i want it to happen you sit on the couch it doesn't change you you got to get up and do stuff but i also want to give acknowledgement to my longtime close friend and colleague of 50 years tom bros whose whose illustrations made it possible for me to convey my vision to the to the world and of course to, to bevan for 30 years of exceptional engineering on his part thank you Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. No one should have any doubt that you are absolutely one of uh, the great commercial space pioneers. So thank you very much, Gary Hudson. Thanks. I hope to come back sometime and talk about the 2000s. Take care.